This video is sponsored by Paradox Arc. Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at Surviving the Abyss, the latest addition to the surviving series of games, this time taking us to the depths of the ocean floor, set during the 70s, with you in charge of an undersea research base. There are a lot of moving parts to keep your eyes on in Surviving the Abyss, and if things start slipping through the cracks, you'll find yourself quickly drowning in a sea of constantly escalating troubles. Today we're taking a quick look at some of the key aspects of Surviving the Abyss, things that make it stand out from the crowd, and how to tackle the challenges they present. Please keep in mind that this video is not a review as it is sponsored, but instead it's an overview of the game's standout features and systems. And if you'd like to know more about the game or get it for yourself for 10% off during the first week of early access, check out the link in the pinned comment below. With all that said and done, and with timestamps down below, let's begin. Undersea Scarcity the first thing that applies immediate pressure in Surviving the Abyss is just how challenging it is to come across the resources you need, and how many steps can be involved in acquiring them. There are a few different kinds of resources to keep your eye on, split into three broad categories. At the top left, you'll find everything having to do with the people at your station, the population, your food supply, and your supply of genomes, with which you can actually increase your population as we'll discuss in a moment. These three elements work in tandem, where food is used to sustain the existing population, genome is used to increase the population, and the population itself is needed to perform a plethora of tasks across your station. In the top middle section, you'll find basic and advanced materials, as well as fuel. Most materials are used to build buildings, while some are used as raw goods to produce advanced materials, like how iron is processed into steel, with steel being a key resource for pretty much any construction you want to do. Fuel, meanwhile, is needed for the production of electricity. Without this, everything shuts down, and if you're not able to keep a constant flow of fuel and the power it provides, you'll find your station running out of oxygen, and shortly thereafter, people. Because they'll be dead. Fuel and materials alike can be found littered around the ocean floor in limited quantities, and you'll need to tell your submarines to go scoop them up and bring them back to storage for later use. At other times, these resources will need to be mined out using extractors, a few different types of buildings that you'll have to research and unlock before you can place them on these infinite sources of material and fuel. Securing these and unlocking upgrades for their associated buildings through the tech tree should absolutely be a priority, especially for fuel. Being low on fuel is such a big deal that the game doesn't just warn you with a tiny notification somewhere, your whole screen is going to go full red alert. But don't underestimate the value of steel either, a key resource not just for the construction of buildings, but also power lines. And without power lines, you can't distribute electricity, and without electricity, nothing operates, including the aforementioned extractors. It's a smart idea to be on the constant lookout for iron and steel deposits early on especially, and you shouldn't take too long to unlock the alloy furnace technology in order to transform iron into steel so it can be used for more important things. But I digress. Moving on, at the top right corner, you'll find power, oxygen, and research points. Power is generated using generators that consume fuels, and it's distributed using power lines as discussed previously. Oxygen, meanwhile, is produced using oxygen generators, and that's distributed through the tunnel network you'll build to connect your underwater structures. Each of these buildings can be upgraded using the tech tree to either be more efficient in their use of raw materials or to simply produce more of their output, and you can also adjust their output by changing how many people are actually working at the production buildings. More colonists dedicated to a generator will increase that generator's output, something we'll discuss a bit more in just a moment. It's important to note that your power and oxygen supplies can be managed as separate grids, allowing you to build redundancies and to manage output and use separately. In order to see more details about multiple networks, you need to use the overlays at the bottom right corner of the screen to get detailed breakdowns rather than the summary numbers at the top right corner. Finally, research points are generated at your research lab at a rate determined by the number and type of colonists working at it, with a daily accumulation that can be spent in a lump sum to immediately unlock the technologies and tiers available to you in the tech tree. It's not a terrible idea then to keep some research points in your back pocket for when you get blindsided by a sudden need that can easily be tackled with a new piece of tech that you otherwise would have had to wait to unlock. While the resources seem easy enough to wrap your head around, it's finding and getting them that can sometimes be the source of trouble. I said you want to keep a steady flow of at least fuel and steel, and you want to make sure you have enough food for your people and enough genomes to grow your population sustainably too. 
that's easier said than done without pushing out from your immediate vicinity. Exploring and expanding in the depths. Your potential reach on the ocean floor is absolutely immense, and while you'll have what you need to get the ball rolling situated near you, it'll only be a matter of a few days before you need to start venturing out into the deep dark beyond. The darkness, to that end, is your enemy. You're not able to build or gather resources from any part of the world shrouded in complete darkness, but covering the ocean floor with floodlights isn't free either. To make sure you're exploring in the right direction, one of your earliest moves is going to be to build and power a sonar tower. This is a fairly large, somewhat independent structure that only needs access to electricity, but can otherwise be left unmanned. The sonar tower will have a limited range within which it can send out a variety of beacon types, letting you know where you're more or less likely to find certain types of landmarks, be it a source of construction material, a source of fuel, habitats, or points of interest that can represent a variety of unique opportunities. There's no cost to sending out pings, and it's not a bad idea to get them going right away so that you know where various resources are densely packed and where they're scarce. Once you've scouted out a potential space to expand into, you'll need to bring the light. While later technologies open up your options, the first tool at your disposal to this end will be just a regular old light tower that needs a bit of power and nothing else. This covers a fairly large radius around it in light, allowing you to build and scavenge in the area as needed, but keep in mind that not even tunnels can be built in the darkness. So, if you find a huge supply of resources further away, don't rush to building a light tower in the area if you need to build a tunnel to the destination as well. Instead, slowly expand in that direction step by step, making sure to light up the path without any gaps, and ideally pursuing smaller deposits along the way so that you're not necessarily wasting construction material either. Keep in mind that some type of resource gathering doesn't require tunnel infrastructure, in these cases, don't worry about daisy-chaining light towers. For example, submarines can scoop up resources that don't need to be extracted, and you can acquire genomes from habitats without needing anything except for light. Keep in mind though, especially in the case of exploiting habitats, some buildings do in fact need tunnel infrastructure to be built. Plan accordingly. At times, you'll need to really push out to find more resources, and in order to do that, You'll need a submarine factory, which can in turn build exploration subs. If you provide these guys with spare crew and sometimes a handful of resources, you'll be able to send them out to points of interest to investigate them, and you'll be able to send them out to seek potential locations for outposts. The map points out the various kinds of biomes that you can seek out, each having its pros and cons. Seagrass dunes contain a variety of resources, coral reefs typically have an abundance of fauna from which to gather genomes and accelerate your population growth, and kelp forests have access to advanced resources. Dark glows tend to contain a great variety of all resources. Basalt columns are typically rich in building resources, but with little coal and limited construction space, and active volcanoes tend to have tons of coal and oil, but almost no building resources. Based on your needs at any given time, You'll send exploration subs out to the relevant biomes, asking them to drop a flare that will in turn allow you to build an outpost once you've researched the relevant technology. This outpost can then act as a semi-independent hub, collecting and managing its own resources using submarines and docks to transport people and resources back and forth between your outposts and central HQ. Setting up remote outposts is a great way to gain access to resources without having to build daisy-chained light sources, but of course, it comes with its own not-so-cheap investment in tech, construction, and crew. Make sure you pursue the right biomes for exploration, and as exciting as it might be to expand quickly, make sure to avoid the threats of mismanagement. If you're not paying attention, things will start falling apart real quick in Surviving the Abyss, and there are a few key elements you'll want to especially keep an eye on. I already mentioned the need to constantly have a supply of fuel without which everything comes to a grinding halt. Apart from that, you'll want a near constant supply of steel as well. Again, even power lines need steel to be built, and if you can't distribute power, you won't be able to run an emergency building that you just realized you forgot to put down, and you'll be left dismantling structures to scrape together some steel to put down one of the most basic elements of your colony. Separately, you also need to keep an eye on air quality. At times, you'll get a warning that people are suffering from poor air quality, which impacts their health and makes them more likely to die more quickly. That's a problem in a regular colony management game, but in Surviving the Abyss, it's even more trouble than usual, as I'll explain in a bit. So, it's not a bad idea to get ahead of air quality control 
and in order to do so, you can either increase how much oxygen is produced within the circuit, ensuring more clean air is produced rather than polluted air, or you can create multiple isolated oxygen supply loops. As mentioned previously, oxygen travels through tunnels, and to minimize the impact of polluted air, you may want to eventually separate your industrial loops from your non-industrial ones to prevent the spread of polluted air from industrial buildings to the rest of your colony. This means separating these industrial zones from the rest of your tunnel network, and in order to do so, you'll need to use docks to allow for the transportation of crew to and from these isolated loops, while preventing the spread of polluted air that would make people sick and ultimately kill them. Keep in mind that the colonists working in your industrial sector will still suffer under the effects of polluted air, and to counter that, you'll need to increase the oxygen supply within that loop, just as you would have done in a larger loop. Similarly, you'll want to keep an eye on the quality of food you're providing to the people too. Eating low-quality food for too long will have similar adverse effects on health, and in order to counter that, you'll either want to research and build a mess hall within reach of your living quarters to avoid these negative effects, or you'll want to research and pursue buildings that can produce higher quality food. They each have their pros and cons, and higher quality food often has prerequisites, like a nearby habitat perhaps, while low quality food can be produced pretty much anywhere. The con being, again, people falling ill and dying. The lack of crew is a serious issue in Surviving the Abyss, and you'll want to keep an eye on any objective or events that come your way and offer additional crew from the planet's surface. Even a few additional colonists can completely change your circumstances as the efficiency of any given building is massively impacted by how many people are working it, and almost every essential building needs at least one individual to keep it operational. Want to generate oxygen? Need crew. Want to generate power? Need crew. Food? Crew. Research? Crew. Exploration? Crew. Make sure you're assigning and reassigning workers appropriately, and don't get fooled into thinking that you need a new building when you instead just need an additional worker at an existing building. Don't, for example, build another power generator consuming all those construction resources to set it up, when instead, you could just as easily solve the shortage by adding another crew member to one of your existing power generation buildings instead. Effective crew management is essential because of just how few people you'll have access to, and the fastest way you can acquire a larger population is also extremely prone to failure. The Cloning Program The core thrust of the game is research into cloning. That's why you're down here, and that's what you're going to spend a lot of your time doing. As mentioned in great repetitive detail, your population is extremely limited, and though you'll every once in a while get a gift of additional colonists from the surface, you'll largely be relying on your cloning program to expand your population. To that end, you'll want to find a source of genomes and, once you do so, you'll want to start collecting them while simultaneously building a cloning lab. A cloning lab on its own is useless, so don't jump the gun, but at the same time, make sure you're planning around the inevitability of needing it up and running. Different habitats will have concentrations of different types of fauna, and they all have different stats which impact the cloning process. Rarer species are typically more viable, but that's not always the case. You'll want to take a look at your cloning lab and get an understanding for how each genome choice impacts your end results. The mechanic itself is built on a simple foundation. Select from the collected genomes up to the maximum number of slots you've unlocked, start the process, and wait for the results as predicted by the little graphic down here. Keep in mind that upgrades made through the tech tree can help speed the process of cloning up, and it can also help unlock additional slots for you to further impact the potential end results. I highly recommend unlocking an additional slot nice and early, because then you're able to use an additional sample for each cloning run, which will in turn increase your likelihood of success, even with the most basic and common genomes. This comes with a catch though. Every clone is destined to a short lifespan, however, the more genomes that were used to produce the clone, the worse their situation might be, and the shorter their resulting lifespan. Unfortunately, especially in the earliest days of your colony, you're going to need some of these short-lived individuals to supplement your workforce, but as you research more tech and acquire higher quality and rarer genomes, you'll be able to see success with fewer used slots, and you'll be able to balance your desires for guaranteed success versus long lifespans. You'll also be able to mix genomes to try and get specialists who are particularly good at improving the efficiency of appropriate buildings or exploration, depending on the kind of specialist they are. 
Make sure to use your genome samples carefully. Once used, they'll be gone, regardless of whether or not you've had any successful clones produced from the round of cloning. So try not to waste the high value genomes unless you're more or less guaranteed to see success the way you want it. The cloning process can seem daunting at first, especially if you get a string of failures early on, but once you get a hang of it, it's really easy to navigate. Just make sure you keep an eye on your habitats and prevent them from being depleted without you noticing. Should that happen, simply build a marine stabilizer building in the vicinity to bring life back to it, or seek out a new source of genetic material. Habitats have other uses too, so you'll want to pick and choose which ones are reserved for acquiring genetic material and which ones are used for, say, power generation or food production. And remember, some biomes are better suited for rarer species, so it's worth exploring some of these distant zones for the purpose of a better cloning program and a higher chance of success, not just for cloning, but for your station as a whole. Acquiring specialists for added efficiency and ensuring all buildings are working as optimally as possible. Surviving the Abyss is available now in early access on Steam, and if you want to learn more about the game or check it out for yourself, feel free again to use the link in the pinned comment down below to do so. There are a lot of elements to explore at the ocean floor, and if you decide to grab the game, I'd love to read your thoughts in the comments down below too. If you have any questions, ask away, and as always, I'll answer all that I can. And to keep up with more colony management, sim, and strategy gaming, don't hesitate to subscribe. And as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time. Cheers.